Hey, church, how are you? Come on, anybody glad to be a part of God's great church? Thank you so much for that. You may be seated. It's an honor, it's a privilege to do what we do. And uh, I'm, I'm always, uh, I shouldn't say always, but I think the, uh, when everything boils down to the reality of how I, how I feel, I end up being really grateful for the privilege and the honor that God's given us to steward uh, our, little, our little portion, our little corner of his church in the earth. And I look back over the years, and I, I, when I look at this room, I think of how proud I am of so many of you. And I looked at your pictures, the pastors at least, before you came and prayed over you, and we've been praying for you, and I, you know, I, I'm just so proud because um, you, have, you have withstood the storm, and you have gone through the fire, and you are still here, and you are still standing, and you are still strong. So I want to jump into the scripture, and I'm, I'm going to read out of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, and I'm going to begin, and I'm not really sure which verse I'm at. Um, I put it on my iPad, but you'll find it. And Matthew 16, everybody say, my heart's open, my mind's ready, make me better, God, by your word. I'm ready. I receive it. I believe it. In Jesus' name. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Can you kind of get a feel for there's a conversation going on? They're looking at each other and they're like, well, well Jesus, that's a, that, that's, can't really answer it as, with one answer. Some say you're John the Baptist and some say, Elijah and still others, Jer Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered. And he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Let's, let's retrack a little bit and rewind. First question, who do people say that I am? People, we got to know this, but it was, it's interesting that it was happening way back then. People always underestimate who Jesus is. When they don't know, they're going to underestimate him. So they're going to say things that are way beneath who he really is. But Jesus quickly then says to them and poses a really direct question. What about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, I want you to think about that moment, because at that moment, there may have been hesitations in the others, but Peter had no hesitation. <laughs> it's like Peter was, I, I know. I know who you are. No posturing. Like no calling for a vote looking around for a show of hands or support from the others. He's like, I, I know. It, his response was quick. It was direct. It was, it was confident. It was absolute. And then Jesus, as we know, he, he said, I tell you that you're Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Now, I want to I just insert for you a little bit of clarity here about the rock. The rock that the church is built on is in knowing the absolute unquestionable supremacy of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's not just that Jesus is the Messiah, it's that Peter knew. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, Peter knew. Look at your other neighbor right now and say, Peter knew. You see, the sustained strength and potency of the church is not built on, on who he is, but in us knowing who he is. When we know who Jesus is, hear me out, we will automatically know things like the inerrancy of Scripture. Like he's not just another teacher. He's not just another philosopher. He, he's like, if you know who he is. If you know who he is, you, you know the value he places on his church. He's not just a voice among other voices. He's not just a philosopher. Like, if you know, you know. If you know, you know that he framed the world and he spoke it into existence. He put the planets in their place. He gave boundaries to the ocean. He formed man and then he became a man. Like if you know, if you know, you know. If you know, then you know there's no God like our God. Like if you know, then you know there's no voice higher than his voice. There, there's no ideology that is higher. And can I just tell you, if the world ever needed a church that knows, it's now. If you were here, if you were here last year, then you know what these are. We decided to bring it back this year. This is called a rally towel. I see a few of them moving in the room right now. Yeah. We brought it back and we want to just encourage and allow you throughout the conference when you want to say, yeah, I know. I know. Because if the world has ever needed a church that knows and a church that will rally around what we know, it's now. <laughs> you know, to just know that we can trust him, to know that he never fails, to know that he has a plan for our lives and for his church. To know that he is the way and he is the truth and he is the light. To just know. Look at your neighbor and say, I know. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor and tell him, I know. Like he doesn't just have an opinion about the truth, he is the truth. Come on, tell somebody else, I know. And then that next line, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So, we are, I haven't introduced my title yet and I know it, okay? Because I didn't want to yet. But I'm about to in just a minute. 
We've all seen the tension and the conflict over the last 30 months. We've seen the escalation of anger, the pushing, the pulling, the fighting. And I want to suggest to you that it's not about what people think it's about. I want to, I want to suggest to you that it's not about a pandemic. It's not about racism. It's not about politics. It's not about social justice or human rights. It's the colliding of two kingdoms. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the colliding kingdoms. See, the colliding of kingdoms is inevitable. Jesus said, don't suppose that I came to bring peace but a sword. It's kind of an odd thing, isn't it? Because he, he the Prince of Peace. And there's scriptures about where he declares peace, like my peace I give to you, my peace I leave. But you can't go over this one. Because he made it clear in this verse, in this context, that a lot of times we don't, we don't acknowledge. He said, don't suppose that I came to bring peace, but a sword. And he was referring to the inevitable conflict between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And I know that some Christian leaders believe that we should avoid the conflict. And as good as that might sound, and as much as we want to say that, or want that perhaps, the current conflict is not one that God's people can avoid. I, I want to say this, pastors, staff, church leaders, those of you that work at the church, you go home to a you know, home, like church at home, you're always in church. You're rubbing shoulders with everybody at church. Like, if you're not careful, you can assume that that's how the rest of the world is operating right now. And I want to just remind you, the people that come to our churches are leaving their homes every day and entering into the conflict. They're entering into conflict at work, at school, in the neighborhood, unavoidable clashes and conflict. And the, the collision is happening within the context of the major spheres of influence. Meaning education, media, religion, politics, government, entertainment, sports. But it's again not about any of those things in and of itself. It's not about that. I said it's not about that. It's not even about good people versus bad people. It's about lies of culture versus truths of the kingdom. I saw, I saw a video demonstrating how wildlife biologists and photographers are trained to mix in and study wild elephants. So way out in the wild, in the jungles, they're, they're trained. And I was watching this video. The video shows time and time again that the best way to handle an elephant, like can you imagine this huge towering elephant, is to stand your ground. Can we talk a minute? Like, are, you feel small, you ever feel inadequate, you ever feel like how in the world, look at the world today, everywhere I turn there's this and there's that, and it's so, it's, it feels so threatening and so intimidating. And these biologists are taught, don't you dare back up. For whatever you do, don't run. <laughs> Stay calm. <laughs> Keep doing your work. Like you plan to be here, right? Well, here you are. You came here looking for elephants, you found them. And you found some rogue ones. Found some that are unpredictable and you don't really know what's gonna happen next. 
And my point is that's exactly what the church has been called to do. We've been called to stand our ground. Come on, we've been called to keep on doing what we came here to do. <laughs> okay, if you're a sports fan, you may have seen this story. I've shown it in, into our own church, but it's a story of a, a young man named Jonathan Isaac. I've got a picture of him. Professional basketball player for the Orlando Magic in the NBA. And on July 31st, 2020, put it in that frame, 2020, July. And what you're seeing is, by the way, a cover of a recently release book that's just called Why I Stand. But what you see is a picture of Jonathan on the front of that. He's standing there and as you can see, he made the decision to do two things. The first one was to wear his team jersey instead of the BLM shirt. No one had done that up until then in the NBA. No one had done that during the national anthem. He was the first. And he made the decision to stand during the national anthem while other people on his team and the other team knelt. Two things different from everybody else on the, on, in the NBA. The night before he talked to his pastor, he told his pastor he was, he was, he was absolutely nervous going into it all, and he told his pastor what he was going to do, and his pastor listened to him and just kind of said, I'm with you, buddy, I'm with you, I'm for you, I'm praying, and he's like, no, pastor, you don't understand, this give me my career. This is going to blow up. This is going to go crazy. And his pastor said to him, Jonathan, you cannot stand up for God and him not stand up for you. Now, Jonathan made it clear what people didn't know is he's not just a basketball player, he's an ordained minister of the gospel. Wow. And Jonathan made it clear he wasn't, trying to, he wasn't trying to create discord in his team. He made it clear, I love my, love my team, I respect them. But he said, I made the decision to stand because I believe that the gospel has changed my life, and I believe that it's the answer for the world today. And I felt like God told me. So there he was, a church boy, because he grew up in church. He grew up in Sunday school classes. He grew up in youth groups. Got to read his book, by the way. I'm going to promote enough his book, I hope he'll call me and come or something. I don't know. but. So proud of him, you know. He, he, there he was, church boy. Grew up his whole life going to church and being in, the, being in the team. He was on the drama team in his youth group, and he talks about all that. Standing before the world, repping his king and his kingdom. Standing up bravely. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? And by the way, he scored 16 points in 16 minutes that night. So he didn't say scared very long. <laughs> Let me go to the next part of that verse. It says, Jesus said, I will give you, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys are for the purpose of unlocking something that's locked. No amount of wrong keys will unlock the door to your house or your office or your car. Like you can have a city full of keys <laughs> that'll not work. It takes the right key, everybody say right key. right key. It takes the right key to open up the door, right? 
Do, do, y'all, do y'all love me tonight? That, that clapping you did for me a while ago, you're going to hold on to that like when I'm done? I just want to say some things that I, I feel like I've earned the right to say. The, the reason that we can have a nation with churches on corners and streets all over our nation and still be in the position that we're in today is because a lot of the church has been using the wrong keys. A lot of the church has been, you know, we've been using our culture keys. And we've been using the culture justice keys. And we've been using the culture of ideology keys. And we've been using the culture's politically correct keys instead of using kingdom keys. And and those are the wrong keys. There's a new nationwide survey of America's Christian pastors. It just came out a couple months ago. Many of you have probably seen it. But it shows that a large majority of those pastors don't have a biblical worldview. In fact, the study says that 37%, 37% have a biblical worldview, and the majority, 62%, possess a hybrid worldview known as syncretism. It's a blend of various culture and religious beliefs. This is why, I said this is why you can go past some churches and the sign out front is the latest culture fad or flag. Promoting beliefs of a secular culture. It's got a little bit of Bible. They got a little bit of Bible on the weekend, a little bit of Bible in the services. They take a text or they read from the scripture, but they're embracing the ideologies that are directly opposed to the teachings of scripture. I, I want to say to all the youth leaders, all the, all the children leaders, let me just say this to you. Make sure that, I I mean, you make the, make youth time fun, okay? But make it fun. Enjoy. We want, we want young people to want to come to, to what we do, right? They they need to be a part of it. And they need to want to be a part of it. But don't take your eye off the target. Take your eye off the target of raising up a generation of kingdom-minded young people who love Jesus and who love what Jesus loves. Come on, young people who will stand against the elephant. Your job is not to build the cool kids club. Come on, we've had enough of the celebrity youth pastors and pastors. Over, out, done, push the eject button and let's get over it and be done with it. We, we don't, you youth leader, hear me. We don't need a youth group of social justice warriors mimicking, parroting the culture around them. Your job, my job, is to teach and train our children to know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to know who He is.
Mm, you see that when I think of the keys of the kingdom, I think of them as being part of the belt of truth. You're going to go to war. We all, we all know. We, we downloaded this into our daughter Jody every day on the way to school when she was just a little girl. I got my breastplate of righteousness, and I got my shield of faith, and I got my helmet of salvation. And you know, the little song, like, but I got that belt of truth. And when I think about the keys of the kingdom, I know I'm from a different generation, but I remember I used to be wild by, uh, when I was a little boy, and I, I would see these guys with a big old, on their belt, like these keys. <laughs> Showing how old I am. Like, now you got one fob fits every door. Like that, but young people, it used to be like that. that like, they, there was, if you had a building like this, there was a different key for every door. And the really important people were the ones that had the most keys. Because it's like they got access everywhere. Like, I get in two rooms and they get in 200 rooms. Like they were really important. So when I, think of the, when I think of the belt of truth, or when I think of the keys of the kingdom, I think of the belt of truth. <laughs> and I want to read to you a little bit about that. And this is, this is really, this has been fun talking to you all about this. But this is right here where I, I've been working to get. It's found in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, the younger of the two, he says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's house which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Newsflash, love is not the pillar and foundation of the church. Truth, somebody shout truth. truth. Say it again, truth. Truth, truth is the foundation of the church. And the Bible says, speak the truth, how? With love. So I'm not taking away from the need and the necessity and the reality of love. What I am saying to you is that love is not the foundation. If all you do is like talk about love, activate love, and you don't have truth, I question if you really love. Because if you're a good parent, you don't just lovey-dovey, whatever they do is fine. I hope I don't offend these children. Come on, pastors. Come on, church leaders. <laughs> Loving your children doesn't mean you adapt to their version of truth. You don't change or compromise truth as a way of showing love to your kids. You don't do that. You call out the lies. Because real love is based on truth. And we're to be the foundation of truth. Like a grocery store is for food and a bank is for money. The church is the place where people are supposed to hear the truth. Huh. 
<laughs> and let me, let me just say this, guys. The church has no authority apart from our king. Our obligation is to our king. Our obligation is not to the preferences of any group of people. Our preferences is, our obligation is not to people that have one thing they want us to say or something they want us to not say. It's, our obligation is not to the traditions of our of families or companies or peers or those who have attended our church the longest or who give the most or who we like the most. Because a little secret is pastors do like some people a little more. <laughs> and if you say you don't, you're lying. But our obligation is not to them. And that will be tested, by the way. The obligation of the church, the eternal church, the church for which Christ died, <laughs> is to our king and to his kingdom. Some people say that pastors are not supposed to talk about political topics. Where did that come from? Did it, did it come from God? Or did it come from people? I'm just asking a question. Did it come from people out of conversations, you know, who want to keep God and the Bible out? <laughs> like, where did that come from? Like, they want to keep God and the Bible out of conversations or messages that have to do with, and let's talk about it, having to do with morality, having to do with sexuality, having to do with marriage, the sanctity of life, human rights, justice, freedom. And, and when, you, when we hear that, people say, to us that you, you're not supposed to talk about politics in church. And I'm, I've been wondering, of course, especially the last couple of years, like where, where did that come from? But I also have felt censored by them. I mean, it's just a form of censorship. And so I've asked myself, is the church supposed to be silent on topics while the world controls the narrative. So for, for, some of you are a little nervous right now. That, relax. J just relax. Forget red and blue for a minute. For, forget it. You, you're too worldly if you're thinking that way right now. Think of the world as God sees it. He sees, hear me out, He sees the colliding kingdoms. The kingdom of the world. He's not red and blue. God is all about two kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. So, you and I both know government left its lane. Government moved over to try to occupy places where it doesn't belong and it started delegating and having a narrative on things that were never intended to be or ought not be a part of government legislation. And so here we are, and here's what I wanna show you. So let's go down the list. We know that in government today, in politics, they're talking about sexuality. So here's the deal, light versus darkness. Forget red versus blue, light versus darkness. They're even talking about marriage. They're changing the original script, right? It's not, it ought not be in our mind, oh, it's a political, it ought to be right away. Light versus darkness. That is not kingdom. I hear that, that's not kingdom. All of this is now in the circle of politics. Parenting. 
What's up with this stuff? You're not going to let parents be parents? Light versus darkness. And you can go on down the list. Sanctity of life, human rights, whatever you want. We got to get away. We got to... We gotta get away from the mindset of politics with red and blue and all of that. We gotta think like God thinks. There's a colliding going on between two eternal kingdoms. Jesus did not come to the world for us to sit around here and play politics. He came to the world to seek and to save those that are lost. He came to bring truth. I said he came to bring truth. Talk about race. The kingdom calls us out of race-related strife into one family. Come on, church. Well, I'm black, I'm white, I'm red, I'm brown, I'm orange, I'm native, I'm... Well, wait a minute. Salute, celebrate, be thankful for your natural family tree, family line. Be grateful for it. But are you kingdom? Are you a child of God? Are you born again? Because the last time I looked, like there's no superiority. There is no preferential treatment. There's only one race, that's the human race. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. And I know it's not always convenient, and I know we come from different, and we want to go, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, I'm saying to the church today, like, I know we all struggle with different things having to do with the Bible and the Scripture and the Word of God. I understand. But what I'm saying to you today is that we have to embrace truth. Christians have to see ourselves as coming from another perspective another way. We have to see ourselves like God sees us. We have to to embrace the foundation of the church as being truth. And we have to be committed to standing for kingdom truth. For the kingdom way. Truth is based on facts. Pilate asked that question, what is truth? Truth, first of all, is based on facts. Truth is not relative. Truth is fixed. Truth is not what you feel. Feelings are not facts. Feelings are fickle. And they change. You're going to feel one way today. You're going to feel another way tomorrow, especially if you stay up too late tonight. You feel another way in the morning. And not based on facts. Truth is not what you think about something or wish about something, but rather what is actual and factual. (laughs) If your five-year-old believes they can fly, you don't help them go to the roof. (laughs) Right? Come on, I'm talking about truth. Talking about truth, talking about true north. Anybody ever heard of true north? Aren't you glad if most of you flew on airplanes to get here? Aren't you glad that the pilot didn't just decide and announce to all of you, we're going to fly by feelings today? (laughs) I don't know about you, I would have got off that plane so fast. Like, where's the door? I'll make one, I'll find one, something. You don't want a pilot flying by feelings. You want a pilot who is trained based on the truth of the equipment. If you go to the doctor, you might wish for a clean bill of health, but the truth could save your life. Yes, very good. 
You might hate what you hear. Come on, you might hate what you hear. But the truth could save your life. I'm talking about the foundation of truth. I'm talking about the church as the foundation of truth. And we don't always know it, but we got to be after it. We got to be trying to find it. We got we to gotta be in a place and in a space where we're like, tell me the truth. I want to know the truth. I want to search this. I want to find this. Because truth is so important. You might say, why is truth so important? In the absence of truth, lies live. Harmful lies, destructive lies. Lies that are cruel and create hardship and unnecessary pain for people. In the absence of truth, lies live. And most of the people that walk into our churches walk in having heard lies all their life and their life is a mess. And anything that we encounter literally in our lives that, that turns us upside down, sideways, I shouldn't say anything, but most of what we encounter that messes us up, somewhere in the mix is, is, is a lie. We thought something that wasn't true. We believed something that isn't true. We said something that isn't true. And we can't stand here tonight. And I'm not trying to stand here tonight and say, I have the truth and you know nobody else knows and I live it all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not the point. The point is I want to respect truth love truth, embrace truth, champion truth. And I want, I want to acknowledge that as a pastor and as a church leader, that the foundation of truth is the foundation of God's great church. Culture is deception, but the church is built on truth. So, you'll only have to hear me one more time in the morning. I actually can't wait for tomorrow morning. I got some exciting things to share with you. But I want to tell you that this is why we have a conference like this. This is why we rally the church. The church is the hope of the world. Church is the hope of the world. And what I'd like to do is, I would like to close this message. I just felt a desire to do this. I think it's God, but it's a desire I have. And I'd like you, if you are, I'm just gonna take a shot at it, 25 years old or under. I just, I wanna pray for you. I want our room to pray for you. Because I don't think the lies will go away. And I don't think they'll have any less strength. And I think that you're called there are young men in this room that are called to stand up to the elephant. And there are young women that are called to stand up to the elephant. And it's going to take everything in you You're 14, 12, 17, 21. If you're in the university right now, you're in high school, you just graduated, you're a young adult. Lord willing, you're gonna live way into the future. And Lord willing, your life will be a threat. It'll be a threat to darkness.
I'm going to tell you before I actually ask you to go to the aisle, I'm going to tell you what we're going to pray for. We're going to pray for confidence and courage over you. And we're going to pray that as you're called to give your life to the cause and the purpose, in whatever way that means, whether it's business or whether it's education or whether it's media or whether it's actually full-time in the work of the church, whatever that might mean that God will call you to do, I'm gonna pray for you that you would have such a tenacious, that like that young man I showed you a picture of, Jonathan Isaac, I gotta tell you, it gave me hope. I needed it in July 2020. I needed it desperately. And when I saw that picture, I didn't know there would be a book. I didn't know none of that would happen. But when I saw that, I, Sheila will tell you, my family will tell you, I grabbed it like a desperate man. I grabbed hold of it because he gave me, here I'm a pastor all these years, but a 24 year old that was willing to stand for the, for the gospel when it wasn't popular. Come on, when it wasn't easy. When he knew there was going to be a price he was going to pay socially. Gave me so much courage. So tonight, I want to pray for young people. Like I said, we'll call it 25. If you're 26, you're still eligible. And all I want you to do is if you're willing to receive prayer from us and this group, and there's a powerful group in the room, I'm just gonna ask you to go to the nearest aisleway, wherever that is. Just, just go down the aisle, over to the aisleway, go to the aisle, down the aisleway. If you're right up here, you're welcome to come to the front. If you're up there, you're, wel you're welcome to go to the, the space in, you know, the uh, walkway in between the levels. You're welcome to go there. And now I'm going to ask, let them, let them get there. Come on, yeah, let's, let's give them a hand. There's a lot of young people over here. Good, young people are coming here. How many of you know God's not done building his church? Come on, how many of you know God's not done with the world? this and it's like they all want to come to the front that's cool too come on come on now if you can I know you're really tight but if you can you can spread enough because I'm gonna ask people to come I'm just gonna ask people you see young people around you I'm just gonna ask you guys pastors church leaders I'm just gonna ask you to move along among them and just just put your hand on their shoulder put your hand on head, put your hand on their back. In the name of Jesus, we pray firm foundation. Firm foundation over young people. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that we have that spirit of confidence. That we have that composure to stand against the elephant. I pray in the name of Jesus, the strength of knowing, that the strength of knowing would be ours, that we would know in whom we have believed, and we would know in whom we have put our trust, and when it is not easy, we pray in the name of Jesus for strength and courage to be light in the darkness. I thank you, God, for fresh anointing. I thank you for fresh passion. I thank you you're going to do some new things in the, in the hearts and the minds of these young people. Come on, church, pray if you would. Stretch your hand toward those who are here and those, those in the aisle. In Jesus' name, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. May you be strong. And may you be courageous. And may you champion the kingdom of God on earth.